It's time for security now. Steve Gibson's here. He's got some. He's got his review of Prometheus. Some security news, of course, and we'll answer some questions from our audience, including a great tip uh, for you LastPass users. Something you might want to change. It's all coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 358, recorded June 20th, 2012. Your questions, Steve's answers, number 146. Security Now is brought to you by Ford, featuring the My Ford Mobile smartphone app for electric vehicles. The My Ford Mobile app makes the electric driving experience fun and efficient. Learn more about Ford electric vehicle technologies at Ford.com slash technology. And by Carbonite Online Backup. Automatic, continuous, unlimited backup for your computer files. Just $59 a year. Try it free at Carbonite.com. And don't forget to use the offer code SECURITYNOW to get two bonus months of purchase. And by Squarespace.com. The fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, visit Squarespace.com and use the offer code SECURITYNOW6. And don't forget, they now offer free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. It's time for Security Now, the show that protects yourself and your friends and your loved ones and your privacy online. Here he is, our explainer-in-chief, our chief privacy officer, <laughs> security CPO. officer, C yeah, C CPO, Steve Gibson uh, of GRC.com. Hey, Steve, good to see you again. Actually, speaking of CPO, we do have a question that we're going to cover since this is our 146th Q&A episode wow. this week. Wow. A question from a listener about career opportunities in security. And uh, I, won't, I won't spoil my answer about that by, by talking about it any further. But uh, Stay I, tuned. You know, we will we'll be discussing that. Uh, I finally saw Prometheus on Monday. Ah. So we can, we can talk about that a little bit. And ah. I wanted to... Also, notify our listeners who aren't following me on Twitter that the second season of Falling Skies has begun. But here I am already starting, and I know that <laughs> you've got a lot to cover. I'll tell you so what. Let's do an ad. How about that? And then uh, and yep. we have questions yep. and answers and all sorts of stuff. And some errata. We, there was a, some, a mistake no. that was conveyed last week I want to fix Never. about that my SQL authentication bypass and the memcomp function in C. Oh, we went on and on about the memcomp functions. Turns out that wasn't it. Okay, well, let's. No, it was. Well, kind of. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll explain. We'll get there. We'll get. There. <laughs> I like to cram it all into one sentence. And I know it's probably not in your lineup, but I really got to know what you think of the Microsoft Surface at some point. Okay, I I know nothing about it. I haven't even it's not, not even on my radar. Oh yet. well, right. uh, Microsoft made a big announcement about they're going to make a tablet called the Surface. And I know you're into tablet computing. There'll be two form factors. There'll be an ARM form factor that uses Windows RT, the, you know, basically the iPad-like version of Windows. And then there'll be one version that uses Windows, Windows 8, the professional version. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting product. Interesting is the best I can say about it. Yeah, I have my iPad. I think I'm done. Yeah, I think that's the problem. <laughs> so when yeah. You're not alone. But before we do that, can I talk about Ford a little bit? Please. Please. I was at uh, an event Ford had in Silicon Valley a couple of nights ago. Uh, I was had a great conversation with Paul Macarenas, who is the chief technical officer at Ford, and Prasad, who is running their new Silicon Valley office. Why a Silicon Valley office for Ford? Because they are really as much a high-tech company these days as a car company. They have an API for the software in the car, Ford AppLink. They have their own apps. Uh, I mean, they think I think they understand that um, the, in fact, they explained to me that they see the car, and I think this is a brilliant insight, as a platform. So what they do is they build into the vehicle the tools, the sensors, 
the 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 pieces that can then be combined as a platform into applications in the car and outside the car and it makes perfect sense they said we can't plan ahead we don't know what people are going to want to do in in three or four years the car is going to last five or six or ten years um how can you know ahead of time? So what you do is you make it a platform and you encourage people in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, developers, to take that platform and do amazing things with it. It's brilliant. It is it's just kind of mind-boggling uh, how, how they get it. And, uh, well, you really see it writ large in their electric vehicle. They're going to be all electric soon, but right now it's the 2012 Ford Focus, their first consumer electric vehicle. This is another thing that Ford is very committed to, going back to the days of Henry Ford. The whole point of Ford was to make it affordable. Sure, you can make a $120,000 electric car, buddy, <laughs> but can you make an electric car that everybody can afford, that everybody who wants one can afford? And that's what we're talking about, the 2012 Ford Focus Electric, available at EV-certified Ford dealers right now. What a sweet ride. I, oh, it's, it's silent. It's beautiful. The torque, the engine, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's interesting because it's all in software now. You can, you, of course, electric uh, engines have huge, massive torque. I mean, they start at 100% effectively. You probably wouldn't want that as you're easing out from the stop sign. So software controls things like that. Software controls so much more. The My Ford mobile app lets you monitor the vehicle's charge state as you're driving or if you're in the living room and the car is in the garage, plugged in. Available for Android, Apple, and, of course, for BlackBerry. Of course. <laughs> yes, for BlackBerry. I'm, they have a Windows Phone version that they've shown, and I'm sure will be out soon. Here's the deal. Uh, you, can, you can look at that phone, and you can see what the charge state of your car is. You can find charging stations. You can plan your trip so that you uh, you know exactly what's the most eco-friendly route. You can even track how much money and CO2 you've saved. They even have, I love this on the website, the My Ford Mobile website, they have leaderboards. <laughs> so so if, you, if you're the kind of person, as I am, who likes to make everything a game, a competition, you can do that too. And share it on Facebook, Twitter, <laughs> LinkedIn. Let the world know, I just saved 800 tons of CO2. Ha ha! Have at you. You can do things like precondition your uh, car's cabin to be the temperature you want it to be. You know, that's something that's a little different in an electric vehicle because you don't have a hot engine now to use for heating the cabin. You have to use the battery. So what they do is they let you precondition the car before you get in. You say, I'm going to be, I'm going to leave it at 830 this morning. Make sure it's 72 degrees in that car. It'll heat it or cool it to the exact right temperature while you're plugged in. Again, saving you money, saving energy. It does so many cool things. I want you to, you know, there is a way to test drive this, believe it or not. Go to your EV certified Ford dealer, drive the 2012 Ford Focus Electric, bring your smartphone, they'll put the app on it, and you can see exactly how it works. They've got a forum, too, where you can share and uh, learn smart driving tips, monitor how far you drive. It's If you're a stats nerd, as uh, Tom Merritt says, if you're a stats geek, you'll love it. It's just, I just think this is so cool. Here's a company, a 110-year-old company. How many 110-year-olds do you know are totally hip and with it and up on the latest technology, huh? I ask you. Ford. <laughs> uh, it was so cool to meet the CTO and to meet Prasad and, uh, and to talk to them about how they view the automobile as a platform for developers. Is that cool or what? Ford.com slash technology. Steve Gibson, uh, Prometheus. What'd you think? Yeah. Yeah, me too. That's exactly my reaction. Yeah. 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 It, it was beautiful, so wasn't it? It could it, have been so you, good. Yes, it could have been so much more. Um, nope. No, we got to say, we're not going to do any spoilers here, folks. No, worry. I'm not going to do any spoilers. Because you one should see things, it. Everybody should see it. Yeah. Oh, I, and I ordered the disc the Blu-ray back on June yeah, 3rd, gorgeous. and I'm glad I have it because I will watch it multiple times in future years as I have watched Alien and Aliens and Alien versus Predator and the, the, the both Predator movies. I guess there's a third one now. Um, First half is like 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm thinking this is going to be the greatest sci-fi movie ever. And the second half is more like Alien. Well, the pro I've, I've, I, in explaining it to a friend of mine, I said, you know, it, f it felt muddled. 
the the, the beauty of the original Alien movie right. was that Beautiful. what it was about yeah. was crystal right. clear. Right. You absolutely knew what was happening. And they just crammed too much random stuff into this. I mean, it was exciting and visual and and interesting and sci-fi and i mean it's got spaceships and how can that be bad but i mean you know annoying things like they just happen to fly over you know the landing site when it could have been anywhere on the on the planet you know and but it wasn't emitting any radiation or any signal or anything so what are the chances of that and then it just and I, anyway i don't want to as, as you said we don't want to spoil it but you know it got a it got a 7 out of 10 on IMDb, um, I'm I'll be glad to own it, but boy, you know it could it, it felt was, like a real opportunity was lost. It was such promise, and you know the trailer huge, made it look so good. And um, huge amount of money got spent. Well, it and was gorgeous. It was like, you can't deny yeah. it was gorgeous. It was also yeah. gruesomely gory. So if you have any squeamishness about blood products, <laughs> stay away. Then we had our new Sigourney. Uh, She's you know, good. Numi well, Rapace is she not great? She was wonderful. She is yeah. a superstar. She was the, uh, the she was a uh, uh, Salander Elizabeth Salander in the original uh, Swedish versions of the girl with the dragon tattoo of the of Millennium Saga. And oh. she's yeah, I didn't recognize her. I had to look her up, and I said, "Oh, her! She was great in that the Swedish version." Uh, and she's a star. There's no question. She's a star. Yeah. Uh, just was. Yeah, wonderful. and and also we were hoping for some clarification, and I think deliberately. Uh, Scott added additional confusion, hoping that there will be a sequel. But all the reports I've had is that the theaters are not full. I mean, people are not rushing out to see this. So I don't know if it's going to make enough money. To, I was to shocked. I, I, I planned, I went uh, opening night. I planned ahead. I bought tickets ahead. I planned to be in line, no line. I got there 45 yeah. minutes early, sat in the front. There was no one in the theater. In fact, the, 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 the kids in the theater kicked me out because they had to clean it. And I went, oh, no, I'm going to lose my great seat. I went out. No problem. I was there when I came back. Yeah. It was not, yeah. It's too bad. I really, yeah. I was ready for the science fiction adventure of a lifetime. Well, we do have another uh, Spider-Man coming up, and we have a new Bond coming up, and we have another Bourne uh, And you movie. forgot another Batman coming up. Uh, yep. Sequel so Mania. We'll have enough things this summer, I think. And speaking of this summer, I tweeted a couple days in advance of Sunday's premiere of the – it's a two-hour premiere, but it was just two one-hour episodes back-to-back -back of the second season of Falling Skies on TNT. And I just – so I wanted to let people know that if they missed it, it will be re-aired on uh, this coming Sunday afternoon, June 24th which ought to give our listeners time to listen to this podcast and cue it up. Um, Falling Skies is not to die for. Its lead actor is Noah Wiley, who, of course, has made himself in the ER series that ran forever. Um, it's, it's okay. The, the first season starts after, we've already, after Earth has already been invaded and the planet pretty much decimated. And so we're, you know, we're the the resistance humans fighting back against the aliens there there's 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 some good computer graphics there i mean it's interesting it tries to be character driven but it's you know anyway it, that gets a 6.9 out of 10 on imdb and i'll watch it um you know the first 2 hours were good it looks like they've got more budget it did uh, obviously get renewed for second season so that says something about it so i would say if if people like sci-fi you definitely need to see the first season. You can't really pick up here with season two if you weren't watching it last year. But if you were, you probably want to continue. And I want to let everyone know that it has started again for, for the summer. As, of course, has True Blood. But I'm a little disappointed in that. That seems to have lost its way. <laughs> um, okay. I think we're just it, bored. It's fourth, fifth season. Uh, I just, yeah, you know. yeah. It was so fresh and new and right. amazing yeah, the first exactly. year or two. Now it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, fine. More vampires. Yeah. Um, so, Errata. Um, the, we, we gave them impression last week that the problem with that MySQL, what was called a MySQL authentication bypass, may have been an error in the mem compare, the mem, the, 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 the memcomp, M-E-M-C-M-P function, 
my my careful explanation made it very clear that that wasn't the case. But people came away feeling that we'd said that there was a bug there, not in my sequel. The bug is in my sequel. It's that the return value from the memcomp function is the, the word in in C is coerced. Um, it's being coerced from its integer value to a byte size value, uh, and that's why the, so my the SQL mem is ignoring the sign, not memcomp. Well, it's ignoring the more significant bytes, and that's the key. If the idea is, if you do a comparison and you have a multi byte, a multi byte comparison, you have to care about all of the bytes in the result, not just the least significant byte. Because the other ones could be non-zero, and in fact, while the least significant byte is zero, which will be the case one out of 256 of the time, which is what I explained. But what, what, so anyway, so what my, what my SQL is doing is they're coercing the return value to a byte, which discards the more significant bytes that are probably non-zero if you don't have a, a password match. And so one out of 256 times, you're going you're gonna to get authenticated when you shouldn't. So I just wanted to correct the record some, to make sure people understood that it was not the memory compare function, which is just fine. It was the coders who, for some reason, coerced, it, coerced its return value into a byte. Um, also, people picked up on this 64-bit vulnerability, which I, I got a lot of people writing in and, and tweeting about that. First of all, it's already been fixed. What this was was a an incredibly subtle difference between the way AMD implements some deep voodoo hardware 64-bit stuff in their chipset versus the way Intel did it. Intel's Intel is where the vulnerability exists. In the case that code was written to the AMD spec, whereas Intel is saying, well, we're not going to do anything about this. Our chips are not buggy because our chips work the way our spec says, except that what happened is people assumed the two chipsets, AMD and Intel, were identical in this really subtle way where they're not. So it caught everybody off guard, but it's... It's, it's a local privilege uh, escalation vulnerability that requires, you know, it's like a theoretical problem. And all the OSs have already responded. It was already in last Tuesday's patch from, you know, of, of this month by Microsoft. So I wanted to let everyone know I'm not going to go into any great detail because it's, it, it's, it's impossible to explain without really digging into details of the way ring transitions work in the OS and and and, and a, just a subtle difference that has already been resolved. So, you know, a tempest in a teapot at this point. And as far as we know, nobody ever, I mean, it's not being exploited. It was, it never happened to anybody. It was just like, whoops, here's something that was found and mm. it's been fixed. Yeah. Unlike the Microsoft XML core services exploit that I talked about last week and urged everyone to follow the fix it link it is actively been being exploited and now its exploit code has been publicly released as a new module to the metasploit exploit framework so that's going to really ramp up its its exploitation if anyone didn't get around to going to that little the microsoft fix it link uh, you can scroll back not very far in my Twitter stream because it'll still be up there near recent since I'm not tweeting a ton of stuff um, and 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 find it. You definitely want to do that because uh, this is exploitable not only through visiting a web page but also targeted exploits uh, through Office, uh, the earlier Office products, I think 2003 and 2008, if I remember, across platforms. So... Definitely something that you want to fix. Um, Firefox updated to three to we're at thir version thirteen now, and we were at thirteen point zero 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 zero. Uh, we moved to point one because there was a subtle problem that 
a the uh, latest version of Adobe's Flash had with a an obscure conflict with something called Real Player Browser Record, which some people had installed in Firefox, and you know, Lord help them, but you know, because we know how you know how we feel about Real Player. Uh, I know Elaine. It's the only thing she can use for transcribing. So we understand, Elaine, you're, you're still using it. You're the it. one who's you're still using it. Yeah. Who needs it? Who needs it, probably. Anyway, so they just, Firefox, uh, you, uh, Adobe said you could move back to a prior version of Flash, but Firefox stepped up and fixed it. It was, a again, a very subtle interaction with the sandboxing, the new Firefox sandboxing technology for Flash, which... Is, ho- is hoping to contain future Flash problems and prevent them from being a ex- turning into exploits that interacted with in some bizarre way with real players browser record. And so uh, Firefox uh, has been updated to fix that. Um, I did just pick up a little note that I liked um, and that it was with the uh, uh, iOS 6 that was uh, talked about uh, and previewed uh, in the re- re- uh, recent uh, Apple Developers Conference, the developer preview release notes mention that under iOS 6, which will be the next major update, the OS will request explicit user permission when an application attempts to access contacts, calendars, reminders, and photos. Anyone who's using an iPhone now or an iPad, any iOS based device has probably encountered the can we have location permission so at the moment it's only your location your your geographic location data wh- which apple had been requiring you to specifically give per- applications permissions to have um yet we've talked about some of what people felt were privacy abuses where applications like I think it was LinkedIn was like sending people's calendars off to, you know, the mothership in order. And they were saying, well, yeah, of course, because we want to you know allow you to look up the profiles of people who you're going to be meeting in the future. It's like, oh, OK, you know, would have been nice if you'd asked. So I, I, Apple is going to be enforcing that at the iOS level. So that there, you know, that'll mean more user interaction. But I think that it's good that it'll give people more control over what apps are are able to do. So I think that's you know moving forward and is a good thing. There was a bunch of news about the FBI making some noise, worrying about IPv6 because they. It's sort of as if they suddenly woke up to the fact. Hey, that what you guys are what? <laughs> well. Now, 4.3 billion IPs doesn't sound like many. I mean, you know, we've got multiple terabytes of hard drive space. So 4.3 billion IPs, eh, that's nothing. Now, with IPv6, of course, we're going to have 340 undecillion IPs which is what we get with 128-bit addresses. What's the problem? So, the FBI can't count that high? <laughs> well, oh, I'm going to be in trouble. Happen- I didn't what say happens that. That was in the Canadians. Pra- <laughs> that wasn't. <laughs> what, happened, what happens in practice is that, that uh, it's up to ISPs to keep the who is database for the regions of the Internet they control up to date. So as, as, as ICANN and other uh, disseminers of address space have been slowly and judiciously metering out the very limited IPv4 space, they've, been, they've had the leverage to enforce ISPs to keep the who's, who are you giving these blocks that we're giving you to records up to date. And I mean, I, as far back as when I was working with Vario, what, maybe 10 years ago, so more than a decade ago, I had to fill out a, a, a how am I going to use the IPs you've given me? You know, it's like an IP justification form. Now they, they call- say, have all you want. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. If you've got 340 undecillion <laughs> right. IPs, th- th- you know, it's just, well, in fact, I, I am being offered when I'm switching, I was going to switch my T. They give I'm you like a process. class C, don't they? 
Yeah, yeah. I have, no, yeah, no, no, a full class A. They give you a class I, A. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll have a full 32 bits of my own. <laughs> That's yours. And so oh, what? Boy. And so the problem is, ISPs will only ever be needing to come back to the trough right. for more, maybe every 15 years or so, right. Right. rather than constantly. And so now the F, the FBI is saying, wait a minute, you know, we have now realized that that we depend upon being able to track back the owners of IPs because you know that's the traffic that we see that's the internet's addressing is the IP the internet protocol address and so it's going to be a real problem if with 128 bit IPs they just sort of go off into a big block that isn't enumerated which could very well happen because they're really isn't anything other than existing protocol which has been inducing ISPs to do this and the fact that they were, you know, in order to get more I, more IPs, they had to justify how they're being used now. And so that justification filtered down to the customer and then back up to the, the formal who is database. So, you know, politically, this is going to be, and all, the, IB, the FBI is saying unless this is, being done voluntarily, we may need some some legislation to enforce this because oh, we need no. to know. That's, oh, that's, they're going to legislate against IPv6. That's been now, said, yes. This, this, uh, see, people are so worried about, uh, uh, quote, tracking with cookies, you know, tracking cookies. This is real tracking. This is law enforcement wanting to know exactly what you're doing, and they're upset that they can't. Okay. Just, On the flip side, I've said, I understand... You know, I mean, that there are bad guys and we would like the FBI to be able to, you know, go get the bad guys. You know, we're we're seeing, for example, botnet operators and people who are doing denial of service attacks. They're being tracked down and caught. And that's a, that's good for the Internet. And but won't they and, know and so, if you get a class C or class A, they'll know. I mean, they still have you're in a range that you own. Even if you're yes. using, so they know who you are. This is this is not thinking. Well, okay, no, but this, it's important to get this that that for my provider who is level three, uh, or in the case of my T ones that I have here at home, Cogent, for for Cogent to ask for more IPs, they need to say where the IPs they already received went, and and if. They've got just so bloody many of them, then they're only going to need to ask every 15 years or so. And so there they just won't be right right now. It's just protocol that that induces ISPs to to keep the who is database current because the the providers of these of these very limited IP vo, IPv4 IPs can say we need you to map out how you're using what you've already got before we're going to give you any more. Prove to us you need more. And so that's happening on a continual basis. Thus, there is some political pressure for, for the ISPs to ask their customers how they're using the IPs. and, and if sort of This is the up. FBI saying we don't really want to have to go through that really annoying – court order subpoena process we just like to have a database of what everybody's doing so we could just you know follow you around we don't yeah. this court order thing it's just so slow it slows us down who needs that because they could get that information right yes it, yeah okay it's just that they want to know ahead of time yeah <coughs> they, they would have to generate a uh, uh, illegal paperwork to induce yeah. the ISP oh, to a, tell who who they gave this block of IPs yeah. to. Do, do the legal paperwork. Don't yeah. be lazy. Many people picked up on the story of Fujitsu cracking 978-bit crypto. Well, so everyone's like, okay, was this bad? What does this mean? And then there was there a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people picked up on the report. It was supposed to take umpteen millions of years and they did it in some 120 some hours um so this isn't a problem nothing to our no, nothing about the crypto we're using today is affected this is 
a completely different crypto technology known as pairing-based crypto. It is very much next-generation crypto. There are there are cryptographic libraries that implement it. It's still deep in academia. Um, it it's an it's a cool technology which potentially solves the the certificate authority trust problem. So it's got everybody interested. It offers something called identity based encryption, which allows you to use things about yourself as your key in a secure way. It's incredibly complicated. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> we'll talk about it someday if it ever happens. But there were theoretical beliefs about the strength of it. And so what Fujitsu did, and this is very good for it, was they showed it wasn't as strong as people thought. And, and a, a perfect analogy is the, 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 the factorial problem. You know, the, the, only, the, the reason, and we've talked about this before, the reason we need 2048-bit keys for asymmetric encryption is the difficulty we believe there is in factoring those, a, a, an integer that large. The reason we only need 256-bit or 128-bit symmetric keys is the, it's a, an entirely different problem to crack it. So cracking symmetric encryption is entirely different from cracking prime factor-based asymmetric encryption, which requires factorization. So similarly, this pairing-based crypto is yet again an entirely different means of encrypting. And so it's got unknown key length requirements. We know what the key lengths are for symmetric. We've, we've settled on what they should be for, for traditional asymmetric that requires factorization in order to crack it now we're looking at a third type and what we, and so it's still you know in academia so what happened is there were assumptions about how long it would take to crap to crack a 978 bit key and that's a weird number all by itself um, and it turns out Fujitsu used like hundreds of cores operate think 200 and some 248 cores cranking away and in a in a what was a surprisingly short time for the academic researchers of this next generation potential next generation technology Fujitsu had a breakthrough so that's good that means oops 978 bits is not enough we'll just add some more so you know so we're we're like determining the the required strength for this key of pairing based crypto interesting but doesn't affect us in any way today Someday we'll be talking about it, and I'll explain more about how it works because it is it, it offers some really, really interesting, cool things. And then in the wacky story of the week, we have the news that an Australian online retailer, uh, Kogan.com, K-O-G-A-N.com, has begun taxing people who, who purchase... From their retail website, Kogan.com, they, they're, ta they're putting an IE7 tax. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you mean if you use IE7, you pay more? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so this is just one of 6.8% tax, which is 0.1% for every month since IE7's <laughs> launch. That is, that is so, so wonderful. I want Newegg so, to do that. That's so great. So the, the, the history of this is sort of fun. Chief Executive uh, Russian, R-U-S-I-A-N, Kogan, told the BBC that he wants to recoup the time and costs which were involved in rendering his website into an antique browser. <laughs> it's the steampunk cost. The steampunk says, tax. IE7 was launched in 06. 
And since then, Microsoft has released two major updates to the software. And, and so the BBC reports that according to Mr. Kogan, the idea was born when the company started working on a major site relaunch. Kogan said that even though only 3% of his customers use that old version of the browser, his IT, his IT team had become preoccupied with making specific adaptations to make the pages display properly under IE7. And, and quoting him, he said, I was constantly on the line to my web team. The amount of work and effort involved in making our website look normal under IE7 equaled the combined time of designing for Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. Kogan said wow, it was Wow, that's unlikely. actually legitimate. It's that, if it's that, really is that hard. Yeah. It should be and a pre- IE8 tax because what if IE55 five, five or 6 what about them yeah and and we have covered the, the news that even I, Microsoft is trying to get people to to let go of oh, IE6 yeah. oh, yeah. and people won't because they've got corporate right. where Internets, it yeah. was written to it and it just it won't work otherwise so he says Kogan said it was unlikely that anyone would actually pay the charges his goal is to encourage users to download a more up to date version of IE or use a different browser. And they had a screenshot in the story of like where it showed on the receipt on the web page an IE7 tax of like it was a whatever they sell their expensive stuff because it was it was a significant chunk of change if you insisted on using IE7 to you to do your purchase. So, I got a big kick out of that. It's kind um, of amazing. Yeah. Bold. I mean, a bold and, I need a new strategy. We should all do it. <laughs> It's got a lot of good coverage, too. So this week and next week, I'm going to amplify something that many people are reporting, and I'm, I'm pleased by it. And that is that Spinrite is becoming very effective. In, well, I mean, has been, but is becoming known to be effective in recovering solid-state drive technology. Uh, Cody reports from Lansing, Michigan. He said, good evening, Steve. I just wanted to share a quick note about, oh, the, the, the subject was Spinrite saved my Raspberry Pi. Um, and that may sound odd to people. We're not talking about something that comes out of the oh, oven. Oh, I think our audience knows what Raspberry Pi is. Yeah. Yeah. He said, good evening, Steve. I just wanted to share a quick note about Spinrite that I found interesting. After months of anticipation, because as people may know, they immediately sold out of their first batch and had to get more. After months of anticipation, I received my Raspberry Pi, a $35 ARM-based computer. I rushed home after work and started tinkering. I have had a 16-gigabyte Class 10 SD card for a while with this specific application in mind. No matter how I wrote the image to the SD card, I was experiencing a wide range of issues when trying to boot my Pi. I gave up on the card, finally, and dusted off a smaller 4-gig one, and everything worked. So I decided to see if Spinrite could even see the SD card. And by that he means, you know, he hooked it to his computer and checked, uh, you know, and, and, check, and booted Spinrite to see if Spinrite would, would pick up the card's presence because it, it would if it was supported by the BIOS. And in this case, it was. He said, and it did. So I decided to run a level two scan. And the only thing I would suggest is, well, no, a, le le a level two scan or a level one scan. You want, you want the, the quick read-only scan on solid state memory. He says, it took a few hours. Then I booted back into Windows. Attempted to run the installer utility to write the image to the disk once again which had continually failed, to my surprise and great pleasure, I was then able to boot the Raspberry Pi into the Debian Linux distribution made for it. I thought I would pass along this unlikely use of your product to help out any Pi owners who might be facing grief with their devices. Thanks, Cody Lansing, Michigan. So uh, I just wanted to reinforce, we mentioned it a couple times, but uh, but the but the... The, you, you don't want to 
You don't want to use the level four that performs a, a read, write, read, write exercise because that's needlessly fatiguing the limited write cycles on solid state memory. But by all means, run a level two because what that does is it forces the, the, the card's processor, whether it's a, an SD drive or a, 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 you know, a, a, a thumb drive or a, um, an SSD card of, of any sort, um, it, it forces the processor in there to verify that it's able to read the sectors, and it does so in a way which will induce the processor to, to, to either rewrite the sector if it's soft or to relocate it if it needs to, to, to move it. So uh, I'm seeing multiple reports now after having mentioned it on the podcast, of people who probably wouldn't have thought that SpinRite would help solid-state devices, and we're seeing that it it, it does. Yeah, and that's I'll very share interesting. Yeah. Another one next week yeah. as well. Yeah. So don't run it on level four. Run it on level two is the tip. Yeah, one yeah. or two. Yeah. Hey, briefly, I'd like to before we get to our questions. We've got ten good questions from you, our good audience. But before we do, I'd like to briefly mention our friends at Squarespace.com. Uh, a longtime sponsor of all the Twitch shows, including this one. A great way to make a website. It, you know, people are always asking me, what's the best hosting? And, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of answers to that question. But what about if you got hosting plus software all together so you never had to worry about updating it? It was always locked down secure. It is absolutely the best hosting. Squarespace sites never go down, but it's because there's such tight coupling between, I believe, because such tight coupling between the software and the servers. They use a fairly sophisticated Java uh, virtual serving technology that ties into the Squarespace content management system to give you beautiful sites that are superbly responsive. And because these uh, the virtual servers will throw more bandwidth, more, more hardware uh, at a site as needed, you just never go down. It's really, it's really remarkable. I want you to visit squarespace.com and and check it out. It, it's uh, Squarespace, S Q U A R E S P A C E, spelled properly. dot com. There's a big green "Try It Free" button on there, and you can use it without a credit card. All you need to provide is first and last name could be fake, email can be fake, a name of a site that should be real because otherwise you won't be able to get to it, and a password. And you have two weeks to use all the features Squarespace offers, including, whoops, uh, not there. Well, there is YouTube integration, actually, but also uh, integration from Flickr and uh, LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter, uh, all the social media widgets. They've got a great iOS and Android app that allow you to post, moderate, and even get stats uh, right from the portable device, which is fantastic. Take the product tour at squarespace.com. You'll love the con the, the style sheets, 60-plus styles. They've got a whole bunch of new ones in there um, by, you know, the best designers in the business. But no site is cookie cutter because you start with the template, but then you get to do whatever you want, and you really have a lot of, of uh, flexibility in there. Very easy UI for both creating and maintaining your website, your blog, your photo. Recently, Squarespace started giving out uh, free domain registration to all annual plan customers, too. So if you've got a site, but you don't have the domain yet, this is a great solution. Sign up for the annual plan. There's zero configuration because they do all the domain mapping uh, for you. You just pick the name of the site. Uh, even if you cancel the service, of course, you keep the domain. They've completely simplified the pricing, by the way, in the subscription plans. It couldn't be easier now. There's basically two plans. There's the standard and the unlimited. Uh, I, you're going to want to look at the unlimited. $16 a month when you buy a year. That means unlimited. I mean, truly unlimited. Unlimited pages. Unlimited bandwidth. Every visitor to the site downloads from you. And uh, they offer high bandwidth, unlimited, and unlimited storage. So... You really have some amazing capabilities. The files uploaded to Squarespace are limited to a maximum size of 20 megabytes, but you can have as many of those as you want. It's, it's really fantastic. So check it out. Try it free. You don't need a credit card. But if you decide to buy, then I want you to use our special offer code, SecurityNow6, 6, 6 for the month of June. If you hear this in July, just add 7 and so forth and so on. 
Security now six for the month of June. And here, here's what you get. 10% off the first year on an annual plan. So I don't know. You do the math, but that's going to save you a considerable amount of money on either the $8 a month or the $16 a month plan. Squarespace.com. The secret behind exceptional websites, their free workshops, too, will help you get the most out of their incredible stuff, software and server and all of that. Domains, hosting, analytics, 24-7 support included. Squarespace.com. Use the offer code security now. Six. All right, Steve, ready? You Let's feel blast good? through ten questions. You got your special thinking cap on? <laughs> All right, here's question number one. I'm going to need a thinking cap to say this name right. He's from Normal, Illinois, but his name is anything but. I apologize. I'm, I think I might get this right. Thanesh Rajandran in Normal, Illinois says... How do you research a topic, Steve? How do you how do you do what you do so well? Longtime Security Now listener here. Six months ago, I was forced to pause my listening because it was my last semester as a grad student and things were getting very hectic. Now I'm playing catch up. I miss listening to your voice in a good way and the richness you share in every podcast. I love it. It's true. Security Now, one of our most popular shows, and there's a good reason. It's all that thinking and smartness, com smartness coming out of off of Steve. The question I have is sort of off topic from security, but I think that nonetheless many may find it useful. I know I would. When you go about researching a topic, as you have done with uh, the health topics, vitamin D or ketosis, or with the security topics like WPS, you always wind up being able to discuss the topics from the ground up, starting with the fundamentals. It's really amazing. So I'm curious, do you have a process when you begin the task of researching a topic, are there certain keywords you use when you Google search? Are there default websites you visit initially and branch out from there? I don't have a spin right story to share yet, but I have my hopes up since my seven-year-old laptop is starting to get a little <laughs> cranky. Hey, that's nothing to hope for. I was just going to say, <laughs> okay, I, hope I, well, get I don't to use think it. that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. Remember, yes, remember that it does, spin right is useful for prevention. Yeah, in so, fact, now's the time to use it. Yeah, exactly. Something's a little cranky. I'd run spin right, frankly, just to see, you know, to like to get some reading on what's going right, on. Right. Uh, but to answer your question, um, what is probably not maybe obvious is just the sheer number of hours that I spend on these things. Um, oh, here I mean, it comes. He's going to want to raise now. All right. No, go ahead. <laughs> no. I mean, what, what, when you're talking about, you know, the, the, the Security Now podcast being strong, you know, you know, you Leo, from just looking at the materials yeah, that I prepare. Really hard, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really do invest in this podcast. And similarly, I invest in the things in, in my own passions. And so, you know, before I, before I surfaced, with a podcast about, for example, you know, the over the sugar hill stuff, you know, I'd read six texts, I mean, six books, and I have a biochemistry text and a ton of, of, of research. So, so I, was, I would say, first off, it's that, you know, this is not something I do for a few hours. This is something I do, you know, in the case of, of low carb stuff for six months before anyone else is really aware of it. So, you know, it's where my life goes for a long time. And, what I, I think the key for me to explaining these things is, is just understanding them. I mean, I'm, I'm yes. never afraid to say I don't know. And I, one, of the th one of the problems I think that techie people maybe have more than others, or I'm just sort of aware of it, is because their identity might be a little caught up in, in being smart and being, you know, oh, he's the computer guy in the family, it's often hard for people to say, I don't know, you know, like, you know, they want to be the know-it-all, the wizard that always thing. have an answer. You could say that. Yes, because the problem is if you don't, if you don't acknowledge you don't know, then you're less inclined to go find out. Right. And, and so I'm, I recognize when it's like I read something and it's like, okay, wait a minute, rather than on, on any level, you know, needing to believe that I understand it, if I really don't, I go find out. And so I think I think that's the only thing I really have is a clarity of what I don't know, which then drives me to find out. And then I'm able to explain it in a way that, you know, that I think is clear. So Albert you know, Einstein says, if you it. He said, if you can't explain something simply, you don't understand it well enough. Yep. 
Yep. I'd also point out, I just read some research that was fascinating, that smart people are oftentimes less logical and more prone to making errors and mistakes because they believe in their abilities so much. Yep, I saw they, that too. Wasn't that fascinating? They don't second yes. guess themselves. They don't yes. think hard enough. Yeah. So that's a challenge that uh, I'm sure people like you have to really constantly uh, give yourself is, wait a minute, I think I understand this. I probably should look into it. Well, I had a neat techie employee who worked with me in the, on the R&D side of Spinrite 20 years ago, back like in the Spinrite 2 and 3 era. And he, he was young. And when we would – when there would be a, like a, a, a mystery, a bug – we, he would he would leap forward and guess right. He, right. he couldn't resist guessing and he was he was gates g-a-t-e-s is an acronym for some sort of like you know yeah they like gifted, a young version of yeah Mensa gifted and talented sort of. yeah that those those yeah. programs are all over the uh the country and they're really good programs the gate programs but yeah the problem <laughs> was he and i said to him his name was jim and and i said well now here's the problem jim is you now have an ego stake in being right. You know, we don't know if your guess is correct, but now you want it to be. Right. And I said, I'm, I have no problem not guessing, saying, I don't know what's wrong. And I, and I believe that makes me more open to seeing what is actually going on rather than sort of trying to bias that result in my direction. So I just, I don't want to have a stake. It's why, for example, I've invested substantially already in the, in the design of this, uh, you know, ketosis, uh, measuring oh, device. Oh, he's building it, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Do you put that on your head? <laughs> the no, hell? You, blow, you, you blow in there. For those listening, it is, uh, <laughs> breadboarded. Lots of, yeah. uh, there's some, I see six, five pots on there. I see yep. a bunch of circuitry wires, and there uh, is a USB little there's interface. a there's a USB interface. Oh, that's cool! So it's USB, and I think yep. I see a thing. I guess that you could buy that off the shelf that you blow into. Oh no, that's a made you from made scratch. That too. It's a it's a chamber that has uh, that has the sensor lo located inside, Dude, which is you rock. measuring. <laughs> anyway, so the that, point you, is that you're calling that the keto flute, right? As I remember, the keto flute. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I've invested heavily. I've had friends blowing in it. I mean, it, it's working, but I still don't hey, come know. Here. Can I get you to blow into this? <laughs> I still don't know if I'm going to have anything. I mean, right. this I'm... This is research. Yeah, it's pure R&D. I, Steve, I this need... is why we love you. I'm getting tears in my eyes. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> I need to answer the question. Maybe yeah. it'll work. Maybe not. But, you know, and, and again, uh, if I have to go, well, okay, that now I know. At least I've satisfied my curiosity without needing it to be something it isn't. So you see, I think that's the, it's important to be a pure researcher, and everybody needs to have that. I, if people could develop that mentality, it'd be so great. You know, if if you don't know, investigate, and you probably don't know. That's the problem. Smart. Well, and that was the know. lesson from the portable dog killer. I just encourage people to go build something right. because oh, the act of doing that teaches you so much. Right. Question two. From an anonymous listener. Steve, with all the recent security breaches of super popular multi-user sites like LinkedIn, what steps should a company take when such a breach occurs? Do they disable user logins and password changing until they verify that the original hole has been plugged? Should they force users to change your password on first login? Should the company randomize the passwords, send users an email with a new password? I realize the security hole in that email, but given that the leaked password could be unhashed within hours, changing the passwords would essentially make the leak useless. Thanks again for a great podcast. What is the right response? Well, I love the question because it, it, it's the right one to ask, and we can answer it by stepping back a little bit and asking what is it which has been lost, which such a company needs to regain. And, and what's been lost is their confidence in their ability to authenticate existing users. So we, they, they, they learn 
with as much surprise as the rest of their customers or users that they're that they've been breached that somehow out posted on the internet are all the hashes of their users logins so certainly they definitely need to solve the problem of the breach otherwise anything they do can just get re-leaked so absolutely they need to as quickly as they can figure out what it is you know that happened how it happened how that data got loose so there's the forensic side they need they also have to exactly as our anonymous listener suggests then be be a 100% skeptical of any uh, of any subsequent login and and even depending upon the nature of their service logins which could have occurred from the time of the breach until discovery that is you know in the case of that um i want to say form.me i can't remember what the site was there was linkedin eharmony and there was another one that where where apparently their their database had been floating around for years oh, yeah, on the internet yeah. so 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 we have this issue of when did the breach occur which is different from when we found out about it from the moment that it occurred anything that had happened since then is suspect and so so certainly the company needs to factor in what services they're offering what kinds of things they do that you know this is different if it's it's if, if it's people pl- posting random comments to uh, to random blogs versus paypal or visa and mastercard for example where there can be you know dramatically more consequences to to failure of their of their authentication mechanism so there there's the when did it happen when did we find out what are the consequences of authentication compromise then then solving the problem so that any changes won't continue to leak out but then and here's really where we come down to what action they should take is how do they reestablish authentication and Sadly, with the way the world is right now, it, it is the relatively insecure email loop, as we call it, is probably the only way to do this. Now, the best practice is not to simply blindly mail, you know, updated links to everyone because, because it's just, you know, you, you would, first of all, that creates a huge burden. Suddenly, your, you know, authentication ability goes to your entire user base what what probably makes more sense is for the company to deny all subsequent logons with the existing compromised password that is set flags throughout everyone's account saying that that you cannot log on right now when new visitors come there they get an explanation which they pr- they should have had emailed to them so certainly the company wants to be responsible and immediately send out email explaining that there has been a breach that they they're they're you know for they're they're pursuing to figure out how bad this is what the consequences are so forth but then um then the the, the idea is users who want to log on should request at that time that they be emailed a you know updated credentials to the existing password they can't obviously use they can't i'm mean, sorry to the existing existing email account they obviously can't use a new email account otherwise the bad guy could attempt to log on as them and immediately commandeer so it has to be the email account that was used which they need to to, to pr- they need to prove continuing ownership of that email contains a link which they click which then authenticates that they're the recipient of email that was sent on demand then they're allowed to 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 uh change their password under hopefully stronger you know uh hashed and and uh uh strong password uh, management technology and reauthenticate so i mean it it's it's a tricky situation and what you would hope is that state of the art companies already had that in place that is that they're not scurrying around waiting for uh, several weeks 
to be able to respond affirmatively. It would be nice if, you know, that even though they never want their password uh, databases to get compromised, if they had planned for it and it was built in so that they were able to initiate this kind of, of process, you know, on demand. And they probably have it in place for the instances already where on an individual basis this needs to be done. So th th this is why in general it doesn't take forever to, to get this to happen is unfortunately they just have to do it on a mass basis rather than individual users saying, hey, I need to do password recovery. It's, uh, it's, it was anonymous and there's some speculation that maybe this was the uh, CEO of LinkedIn that was asking, but I don't think that's the, probably the case. No. no. Hopefully he's got IT people. Who, <laughs> although, given that they used an unsalted MP5. Maybe he doesn't maybe, have any IT maybe, people anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to answer your question, Mr. CEO. Thank you, Reed. Jared in Australia wonders about testing connection bandwidth. When you use websites to test your connection speed, for instance, speedtest.net, and uh, press begin test, it finds the fastest server for testing geographically. But that's not always the closest However, after the test finishes and the results are shown, why in general is the upload speed always the same, even when the test is run multiple times for accuracy, whereas the download speed is often, you know, varying around? For instance, on my uh, DSL, I get 9.4 megabit download on average, but sometimes it's 9.35, sometimes it's higher, nine, but, but it's usually between 9.35 and 9.40. The difference in the upload speed is much smaller, but 0.86 to 0.87 megabits. So why, Steve? Can you can you explain this? Okay, so he wonders why, why there's the huge difference. Why the variation in download but not upload. Yeah, Spence. now actually there's less variation in download than upload when you look at it as a percentage rather than as an absolute, which is probably the proper way to look at it. He sees between 9.4 and 9.35 megabits download but that's only a difference in half of the second significant digit from 9.35 to 9.4 whereas he reports that in uploading it's 0.86 to 0.87 which is a difference of one whole second digit so so even though it's counterintuitive as that there's actually more percentage variation in what he's seeing in upload than in download. But in general, I like the question because everyone wants to know what their bandwidth is in like typically in downloading things. And as we've looked at the internet, we understand that it is, it is based on a best effort packet delivery where routers that are overloaded have official sanction to simply discard packets, which, which will stall the traffic and require them to be resent. We also know that most downloads are over TCP, which requires that the packets come in, ultimately arrive in sequence. So if, if one packet is lost and other packets are sent, then the lost one needs to get retransmitted, and that generally means retransmitting everything from the lost one back. The point is that there will just naturally, this is not, a, this is not like in the modem days where we had wires connecting the, the two points. Instead, we're sort of spraying packets out into the ether, and they're wandering their way toward their destination. So the proper means of measuring bandwidth is to simply use the largest number you can ever get. That will be <laughs> That's your, your max. actual bandwidth. Yeah. Anything yeah. less is a consequence of some you know, momentary loss along the way. So, you know, run the test 10 times and see what the best is you can get. The Don't best average it. Is, Look at your peak. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That makes that's, sense. That, that's the best, best stable number. Yeah. Before we get to our next question, I do want to remind boy, this is something I should remind everybody every week. I do on the radio show to back up. You wouldn't need spin right, you see, if you just make a backup. Good news, Steve. Most people are still not going to back up. But those of you who are smart and listening right now might want to try Carbonite Online Backup. Steve gave it his TNO award for their encryption. They use strong encryption, and only you have the key, not Carbonite. 
so that your stuff is stored on the cloud safely, securely, privately, available whenever you need it. Even before a disaster happens, you just log on to your Carbonite account from any computer or smartphone app or tablet, and they have the free apps, and there you are. There's your stuff. But if you have a disaster, you get it right back. Continuous, automatic backup to the cloud. This is what Carbonite does, and they do it easier and more securely, more effectively than anybody. And most importantly for a lot of you, more affordably, unlimited backup, PC or Mac, $59 a year, less than 5 bucks a month. They also have... Additional plans for multiple computers in a small business or uh, for external drives. Go to Carbonite.com. Check it out. Use our offer code, uh, which is security. Let me see. I think it's security now. Yeah. Use our offer code security now. And uh, you can get two weeks free so you can see how it works. That's usually enough for your first backup set, too, which is nice. Kind of gets you started. And uh, if you use security now when you try it, when you buy it, you'll get two months free. 14 months for the price of 12. Even better deal. Carbonite.com. It's backup done right. Give it a try today. Security Now is the offer code. We thank uh, them for really long-time supporters of uh, Security Now. And it's good, too, because they're TNO. All right, back we go to the questions. Question four from Ireland. Bart B. in Maynooth, Ireland, suggests a method for determining uh, a user's DNS server without JavaScript. Remember in uh, 356, Steve uh, talked about a few ways Google might be able to know what your DNS server is. Google was warning people when they uh, had DNS changer that they had malware. He says, I think it would be easy to do in the following way, entirely server-side without any reliance on JavaScript. What you need is for your web server, Google, to communicate with an authoritative DNS server under your control. You set up a DNS zone for the purpose of testing DNS servers, and you run that DNS server. You have that server log the IP requests to it for a given subdomain. Logging to a database with our syslog would do it for you without even needing to hack your DNS server. Your web server inserts a request for a JPEG. <laughs> this is very complicated. <laughs> I, I hope I'm following this, and I may be reading this wrong. But your web server inserts a request for a JPEG image. When I say you, I mean Google. Yep. Or whoever's trying to do this. Google's web server inserts a request for a JPEG image on a one-time subdomain of their controlled test domain into the website it returns to the client. This will cause the browser to resolve that domain using the visitor's DNS server. Since the subdomain is a one-off, it can't be cached anywhere, so that DNS server will have to request the relevant A record from the authoritative server. In other words, that server we set up. The, the DNS server, the web server, can then check the DNS server's logs <laughs> to see where the request for the one-time domain came from, hence telling the web server what the visitor's DNS server is. This would work if you got one request a minute, maybe. No JavaScript needed, and even a moderately skilled sysadmin could hack such a system together in a day. If I had to do it, I'd set up a bind DNS server on a CentOS 6, logging into MySQL, using the default R syslog syslog implementation that comes with uh, Red Hat Enterprise-level CentOS. I'd then create a simple CGI script running in Apache to query the MySQL server for the relevant logs. Show off. <laughs> Thanks for the show and for Spinrite. Keep up the great work. There's now more than one episode of Security Now for every day of the year. That's true. Quite an achievement for a show where each episode is at least an hour long these days. Hats off to you guys, Bart. So I wanted to acknowledge Bart's note and the similar notes from many listeners. That's a really, who, you know, it's an interesting, uh, you know, mind bender. How would you do this? Well, yes. And, uh, you know, I've done it because everyone will remember oh. the the spoofability test. Right. Um, I wrote a pseudo DNS server, of course, in my case, in assembly language, which does just that. When you do this, use the spoofability test, it sends a bunch of uniquely named uh, images to your browser, causing your browser to ask its DNS servers for the IP, which causes them to ask GRC's authoritative server for the IP, and as a consequence, oh, I get I get the queries from the users' DNS servers that allows me to determine um, how spoofable they are. Don't you? I and mean, so isn't there an issue though with timing? I mean, you have to say, well, and if you, I mean, if you were Google and you had a million requests a second, this is going to be a very difficult thing to do. 
Yeah, it's exactly. I, I it, it can work. I love the fact that so many of our listeners are on the ball That's to this so degree yeah. that they that they picked up on it. I've implemented a system, as I said, just like it for the for the spoofability test. So, you know, it certainly does work. Uh, and so I wanted to acknowledge everybody who said, hey, Steve, this you could do it this way, too. Have to be a low traffic site, though. I, I mean, if you got 20 requests uh, in, a, in a few seconds... It's going to be hard to say, well, that one came from here and that one came from here, right? Ah, no. The, the, the way you do it, though, is, for example, you ask for ZQRD7, ah. you know, blah, blah, so blah. So you have dot, a unique JPEG for each each time. A, a neat domain name, and, and uh, you tie that to the user session. So you're exactly. always generating unique domain names. That makes sense. Exactly. So that way you could just say, well, who, what domain name asked, you know, who yep. asked for this domain? To, to who do we send this query? Right. That makes sense. Yep. So then you could handle it, I presume, millions of times a second. Yeah. I wonder how they do it now. Do you think they do it I that think way? They, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, that's a, a nice, solid, robust way of doing it. And, you know, GRC does lots of spoofability tests. I, I can handle, you know, huge numbers right. of, of people doing that. Okay. Yeah. Jessica Tallon, Lancaster, UK, notes, last pass password iterations. Hello, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Jessica, that's mean. I, hello, 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 Mary Poppins. I religiously listen to security now and would first and foremost like to thank you on the fantastic job you and Leo do, not to mention the wonderful Over the Sugar Hill episodes. I remember a while back uh, you mentioning LastPass would soon start offering password iterations. You said they were in the implementation phase. However, I don't recall you following up on that. I was poking around my LastPass settings today and noticed when you log into your vault and check the settings option along the left-hand side in the general first tab, you notice a new entry, password iterations by default, at least for existing users. It seems to be set to one, which of course means no added security, but it does recommend cranking it up to 500. I cranked mine up to 1,000. That's the highest it recommends. I thought it should be something worth noting, as it isn't automatic, and uh, the user must take action to ensure they get this added security. Thanks again, Jessica Tellen. Yes, I wanted to pass that on. That's a very good point. Anyone signing up for a new LastPass uh, account will have theirs their their default set to five hundred. Ah. But any of us who have been using LastPass since I first uh, did the the uh, careful, comprehensive podcast about it or anyone who knew of it before then will have as i do or did rather it's still set to one so they so it needs you the last pass user to go there and crank it up um and um uh you don't they allow the setting up to some huge number um uh a hundred thousand rounds um but the problem is all devices that you use LastPass from would have to be fast enough to do that, and things like iPads or iPhones or something may not. So they recommend not going, you know, you could go to 1,000 if you wanted to, but they're already using SHA-256, which is a deliberately slower hashing algorithm than SHA-1. So it's the reason you do these multiple rounds is to, to slow down any brute force attacks. So they recommend 500. You know, our listeners probably want to go 1,000. And the only consequence is a slight delay when you're authenticating just that one time that you're providing your password. In your browser, it's got to crank doing this crypto X number of iterations where you decide what X is. Then it sends the final hash to LastPass. So – uh, I just wanted to. I thought it was a great note to let everyone, you know, go ch go lo look in your your um, vault, click on options or settings, and right there you'll see in red they've got it. It's highlighted for me. It was in red because mine was still set to one. Yeah, so was mine. Course, yeah. I, yeah, I cranked it up. Yeah. So. Uh, so yeah. thank you very much, Jessica. Yeah. And you think five hundred's adequate? Yeah, I really do. They, I mean, I'm sure those guys recognize they used a slow algorithm right. um and uh and so forth so this is uh, to protect to make your password more rely your login to last pass password more secure more resistant to brute force attack it. it slows so it down exactly yeah okay good i'm doing that right now 
And since it is both client and server side, as you said, you, you don't you want to make sure that uh, you you don't set it too high because you could your iPhone could well take because a long it's time because to log the, in. yeah the, all of this um, all of the hashing is done on the client right so some clients are slow right um, although and, I think an iPhone's pretty fast these days so. I think it probably is Mike Kalmus in Washington D.C. wonders about Microsoft's "you're doing it wrong" attitude towards security. Steve, I submitted the following problem report to Microsoft regarding. Internet Explorer, and got the subsequent response. I wonder if you could comment on the attitude, this attitude industry-wide, uh, and possibly help getting, get Microsoft to do something about this issue. Thanks for security now. Love the show. My message to Microsoft. When client certificate authentication is used in a website, in Internet Explorer, particularly with a common access card, CAC, i.e. caches the certificate information such that the browser must be completely closed, all windows and tabs, for another user to use the system. If the browser is not restarted, the original user's certificate will be presented to the website, and that user's information may be then disclosed. <clears throat> this occurs even after an access card has been removed from the system. This occurs in all versions of Internet Explorer that we've tried their response. Hello, Mike. Thanks for your message. Completely closing out all browsing sessions is considered a best practice for ensuring that any information present in the browsing session is completely removed, including authentication cookies and session IDs. And then they point to a discussion on MSDN. Regarding yeah, so Nate. I, um, you know, I'm no apologist, Lord knows, for Microsoft, but I think I, I thought about this for a while, and I don't disagree, frankly, with Microsoft's statement. The problem is really that we're asking for something from our browsers that they're just not very good at. Um, I mean, this is similar to the advice to log out, manually log out of a website that you're persistently logged into. Otherwise, as we all know, somebody else could come along and, you know, the browser doesn't know it's not still you. So, I mean, the, the, the problem of the common access card not being polled constantly uh, is, a, is an efficiency and performance trade-off. Um, uh, I guess my feeling is if you're needing to use your browser in, in a mode where you really need user authentication security, then perhaps enforcing the use of the private browsing option that all of our browsers now have, where when you terminate private browsing, it, ex it expressly isn't saving anything persistently on the machine. I think that's probably something that the, the, the server serving the pages uh, could and should um, detect and verify. And that, unfortunately, it, it is, it is the, the user's responsibility to revoke authentication because otherwise our, our browser-based authentication is, is sticky for the sake of convenience. So it's one of those security versus convenience trade-offs. Yeah. All right. So I, yeah. I think that that makes sense. The choice they've made makes sense is your point. You could argue about it, but I think it's not just for uh, these uh, CAC certificates. There's lots of reasons why you need to restart your session. Yep. The problem is in Windows... Well, no, I guess Windows actually does it better than the Mac. And the Mac, you can close all Windows and st the app will still be running. On Windows, when you close the last window, the app closes. So presumably, yes. if you've closed the last window, you now have restarted the browser, right? Right. Okay. So actually, that that's another reason why what they do is probably the right thing to do. There has to be a window still open uh, for the browser to be running. Yep. Jody in Florida wanted some uh, clarification about there's two kinds of salt? Well, yeah, you have your sea salt, and no, not that kind. In your discussion about salted hashes in episode 357, you grabbed my attention when you seemed to distinguish between a generic and a per-user salt. I'm familiar with a situation where each user has their own unique random salt value and assume that's what's always done to implement salted hashes. Are you saying sometimes there's only one? Are you saying, Steve, sometimes there's only one salt value system-wide used to compute hashes for an entire user database? If so then your opinion that the salt should not be stirred with the hash values makes a lot more sense. In the case of per-user salt values, it always seemed to me storing the salt values on a separate server from the hashes isn't going to provide significantly more security because, you're, you know, it's already one per-user. 
I hope I'm not the only one that could use some clarification on this. Thanks, Jody. So, uh, Jody, yes. Um, one thing to remember is that many of these database exploits are are obscure SQL database table traversals, which we talked about years ago, where you 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 inject some cross site scripting that that and explore what the table names are, and you know end up dumping it out like through the browser actually, so, uh, and uh, and acquire uh, a database that was never ex- expected or supposed to be exposed publicly through that channel. But what that means is that the bad guys haven't actually penetrated your network. They're not roaming around from machine to machine. And it's not like you got ins- infected by flame or, or, or some you know, serious spyware. Certainly that, that can happen and, and could. But typically it's, they, they've just gotten a sort of a shoehorn in that lets them get the database, which means they have no access, for example, to a system-wide hash which is not stored with a database. If you store the hash, the per user hash along with the hash and they get the database, then they get both of those things. So that's why last week I explained why really best practice is to do both. Have a system-wide hash not in the database, but just sort of like in the code somewhere, which 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 could get it could escape, it could become known, but it also may not. And if not, it just provides you with additional security. And then also you want to do a per user hash because that just makes it's zero effort to implement and you'd really do get better security. Bill Prast, Tampa Bay, Florida, wonders about a career. Oh, this is the one you were talking about. Wonders about a career in Internet security. I love security now. I wake up listening throughout the day and at night and I listen still. <laughs> Just the security now, over and over and over again. I'm an IT security AS degree seeker, currently prepping for CCNA security credential. You and Leo give me an inspiration. I'm a 27-year-old single dad and nighttime student. Good for you, Bill. Yep. He's working hard. I work in the IT field now. It's a great experience, not so much money. What kind of career outlook do you think I'll see in a year in the IT security field what can I expect to face in the IT security field? Bill Prass, IT technician at General Telecom LLC, studying for his security credential. I think that's great. Good on, I good on you, Bill. And and for what it's worth, many of our listeners are students and have been inspired by the podcast to focus on security. Well, we're required which, listening in a lot of classrooms. Yeah, we're assigned. Yeah. And I really do think there is a bright future. I mean, I wish there weren't. <laughs> from the standpoint of yeah. boy isn't it too bad <laughs> but but increasingly in the future security won't be something outsourced it won't be something that is an afterthought it won't be something where a company hires a security consultancy to to like set things up and then wanders off there will be an in-house security person and I, I just think I, I, one of my theories of employment in the future is specificity. The more specific your skills are, you can be found on the Internet. You, 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 are, you, 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 you are something that people understand. And being security, I think, makes a lot of sense. It is, unfortunately, a growth industry. Yeah, exactly. Good business to be in today. Ben and you know, Moore. Leo... You've got to go. No, I don't have to go. No, 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 no. Let's keep going. Really? I'm having a good time. Two more questions. Two more questions. We can make it. Ben Moore, we're trying to keep the show a little shorter uh, per request of many people on Twitter. Not too short. Don't worry. It ain't going to be a 10-minute show. It, no way. Well, we're at an hour and, and 20 minutes yeah, right now. Yeah, we're good. So. I think an hour and a half is the right length of the show. Ben Moore in South Haven, Mississippi wonders, what the heck is Java FX? I'm a longtime listener to Security Now, proud owner of Spinrite. I pretty much quit installing the Java runtime environment on new computers. I still have a lot of older ones where it's installed. Recently, these older computers started upgrading to Java 7. But when they do, they're also silently installing something called Java FX. What the heck is Java FX and why do I need it? Maybe I should just uninstall Java everywhere. <sighs> okay, so this is more bad news. Oh, no. Yeah, this is Oracle deciding that 
they want a piece of the flash. Oh no! Ado- Adobe Air <laughs> Silverlight market. <sighs> this is their their special effects, uh, you know, delivery platform. It used to be a script that would run under Java, and they've now compiled it into bytecode as a separate library, and they're now promoting it as essentially the same thing as Adobe Air or, or Microsoft Silverlight, you know, one of these content delivery platforms to provide a, a library of, of like helper effects for people who want to do this in Java. And sadly, they're just sending it out along with Java 7, which we know will have things that are exploitable. There will be mistakes there. People are getting it even if they don't use it which means that websites, web browsers will, will display something, uh, uh, fall through some glitch in the code and get their users in trouble. So Great. I say more than ever, if you don't know you need Java, get rid of it. I love what Apple has done. The, no, the notion of it disabling itself and requiring you to manually say, yes, turn Java that's, on. That's how it should be. Oh, it is per, exactly on a the per, way per uh, session instance. basis. Yeah, per instance. Yeah. Yes. So it doesn't just remember that. On, and if you leave it on, it turns itself off again. Mm-hmm. That's 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 where we're headed. Right is that it. kind of security? And that would be good for everything. You yep. don't need it's to have well, it running it's, always. It's what it's, that's that's called no script, Leo. Yeah. Oh well, yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that. <laughs> All right, you're gonna win eventually. Just you know, Charlie. Uh, Guthrie in Richmond, Virginia. I'm sorry, Richmond, California, just down the road a piece. Wonders about his voice as a password. Steve Vanguard, the mutual fund company, now offers the off uh, choice of using voice recognition as a password. Not as a password for their website, only when you're interested with talking them to them on the phone. Before, when you called, they asked you several prearranged security questions. Now, you just have to repeat a set phrase, and if the voice print matches, they'll talk to you. Huh. I don't think you've ever discussed this technique on your show. I was wondering if you consider it to be secure. That is secure, assuming they do everything else right, like securely storing the voice print and so on. That's interesting because, you know, the voice calls are only 8-bit sound, so there's not a lot of information there. Maybe it's enough. Right. Um, Certainly the loss of fidelity over a phone is a big problem. Yeah. Um, What's interesting is that uh, I did a little research because I was fascinated back in my uh, high school years with speech synthesis. And in fact, one of the things I did at Stanford's AI lab was program their deck PDP 10 to sing the Eagle song Desperado. <laughs> uh, yeah, was they, it good? There was there, it, actually, it was. There was, some, there, there was something called a Votrax synthesizer, uh. which, which was a phoneme, something called a formant synthesizer. The idea that the theory of speech is that you have what's called a buzz source, which is our vocal cords. And then the, the, the actual the shapes physical, it. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, all, all our, actually our, our throat and tongue, all of the aspects of our larynx physically shapes that. And what forensic studies that have been done by the FBI and other law enforcement have shown a remarkable specificity for recognizing specific voices. That is, for example, in a courtroom, they have shown better than 0.3%, I mean, lower than 0.3% error. So extremely low error. Now, this isn't, it's not just you speak and we will identify you from our entire user base. No, the way this works is we have figured out who you are before. You've spoken into you you have in setting this up you know you've identified yourself you're you're saying this is who you are we have your voice on record and so it's a an a b comparison system where it verifies you know very much like it's less like a thumbprint where you know at the dmv you gave them your thumbprint and then later on they say is this the same thumb that we saw before that's harder to, to record though than voice what if i have a recording of that person saying that sentence yeah uh, that's i mean that's it, it is absolutely spoofable yes yeah, very easily especially Yes, 
Um, so it's it's you know it's not super secure, but over a but over a phone line. I guess my point is that if you know who you're expecting it right, to be, right, then then you actually can rule them out or not, and it is incredibly difficult for someone who has not recorded right. the the authentic voice to to spoof them because there there no no two people have the same physical throat mechanics and, th- and so it's it's both physical throat sizes and also then and th- and that's sort of like static aspects and then the dynamic aspects of the of the actual way they speak the, th- that specific phrase yeah so I, I i think we're gonna see more of it certainly it's been fodder for sci-fi for a long time yeah <laughs> cutting off people's thumbs has also been fodder for, for oh, more yeah. than sci-fi exactly uh, great episode. Great questions. Thank you all for uh, for asking. You, of course, can go to grc.com slash feedback to ask your questions. That's Steve's site. You can also follow Steve on Twitter. He's at SGGRC. He also has at SGPAD and at SGVLC. You didn't really follow the Microsoft Surface announcement, huh? I didn't. Yeah. I'm curious. Well, you know, at some point you'll. You, it's, it's one of those things where they didn't announce availability price or anything. Uh. So it's going to be. Uh, it's they said when when Windows 8 RTMs, but that's you know who knows when that is September. I don't know. Well, and I'm just not a Win 8 person, Leo. I just I I'm staying with XP till. I, mean, I guess you're I, the gonna... wrong person to concern yourself about this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, I just that that whole pain look or whatever the hell they call it. It just looks awful to me. <laughs> yeah. I can't. Yeah. I can't really imagine you. It's oh. like having a command line person use a GUI. It's just it's just a little too much. Yeah, that was a that was a painful transition. I'm sure that too. was very difficult for you. I to only understand. launched Windows in order to use. Uh, Micrographics designer <laughs> back in the early days, you know, when I actually needed graphics. Otherwise, I was happily in my command prompt, <laughs> right? Writing spin right and, assembly. And I presume, because I don't, th- I know you have some Macs, but you don't use uh, OS X day to day. But I pres- so I presume you did not order one of those uh, Retina display uh, MacBooks. No, but I did salivate. I don't, I just don't use it enough to justify yeah. a couple thousand dollars. Neither that do just- I, but I did it anyway. I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> and now I can't use anything else. You know, I have to use my iPad, my iPhone, and my Retina because everything else looks f- blurry. It really is spectacular. It does make it? a difference. You start to get used to it. It's not a good thing, actually. Don't get used to it. Yeah, so, I, I noticed that when I have a, my iPad 3 underneath my anti-glare plastic for the one I carry around outside, and the, my, and the two that I have in the house are not anti-glare and Oh, they look so nice. Yeah. Because the the anti glare filter does knock back right. some of the sharpness of the screen. You know, they've done something because I know you don't like these uh, shiny screens. They've done something in the new uh, MacBook uh, Retina that is uh, much less glary. I, I don't know. Maybe there's micro scoring Good. or something because it's Good. it's it's there's some glare, but it's blurry. It's not the mirror image that you used to see. So Good. it is. It's much see. nicer in that regard. Good. Yeah, and I, I'm sure they'll put that on the iPad next time. Steve Gibson is at grc.com. That's where you go to find Spinrite, the world's finest hard drive, maintenance and recovery utility. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Bye, bye, bye. Come on down. You should have like a sale someday. 10% off for the first 20 buyers. Nope, nope, nope. I, he said it. I said it. He didn't. Don't get your hopes up. Uh, you can also get a lot of free stuff. See, that's the point. Steve gives you everything except that one thing and maybe the, 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 the ketosis flute. That you'll well, probably have to and, charge for that. And <laughs> what we do, I'll, I'll, I'll note that even somebody who bought Spinrite 20 years ago, we will still give you a discount you on, on today. So we that. are never going to leave anybody of, no. any of our users high and dry. Steve is conscientious, no that's for sure. You, he also spends a lot of his money on things like transcriptions of this show. He makes 16 kilobit versions. That's all available at grc.com for the larger file size or the video. You can get that at twit.tv. We do security now Wednesdays, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Soon to be even more on time. I'm working on it. I'm going to get out of bed earlier so I could be here on time. 11 a.m. Pacific uh, and uh, or 1800 UTC for those of you worldwide. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that we've got a, a team of uh, geeks. I thought they were in a biker gang, but they say no, we're all uh, we're all we're an IPTV gang. In from Canada, actually, uh, Adam uh, Erstel, Kirk Fearback, Ken Delaney, Lyle Bryan's Bands, Brian. Bryan's. Oh, I see, Brian, Bryant. 
It's, this handwriting's not mine. And uh, Grant Backus, thanks to ha- for uh, you guys to come in, and they all enjoy this show. They were just on tenter hooks the whole time, Steve. <laughs> uh, just oh, seriously, the best audiences during this show because they're like the super nerds. Glad to have him. It's like having shell- five Sheldons in here. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Thank you, Steve. We'll see you next week on Security Now. Thanks, Leo. Security Now.